Welcome to the Sargasso Champions course. You are currently tuning into one of the videos produced for this course. Founding for the course comes from the Resilience, Sustainable Energy and Marine Biodiversity Program, Resenviv, financed under the 11th European Development Fund, EDF, Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Regional Program. Resenviv is being implemented by Expertise France with the primary stakeholders being the 12 Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories. Let's get ready to learn together. So today we're going to talk about all the different products we can make from Sargassum. To get you guys a bit excited about what can be done and also thinking about which products would be useful for your island. Um, you know, there's a lot to think about, like how much Sargassum does a product actually take? Like, will it make a dent in the amount of Sargassum that comes to your island? But also, is it a product that can be used on the island or would you have to find customers outside and ship it, which can be difficult? How difficult is it to produce the product? Some take quite a lot of um, steps. Others are quite easy to make. So there's a lot of things to think about. And a lot of companies who are making sargassum products, they actually are looking into making multiple products in kind of like a chain so they can make several products out of the same sargassum. And yeah, you already listened to our videos, so you know that there is a lot of hurdles to making these products and that um, um, making them is not that easy or making products out of sargassum. And maybe you will also tell us some product-specific hurdles today. So we're going to start with activated carbon. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, in St. Martin, we discussed activated carbon as a product for sargasm. Um, so activated carbon holds chemicals from vapor and liquid streams, cleaning them of unwanted chemicals. Um, so for example, it's often used when people make those uh, terrariums. Um, I have a whole list of different places that it's used, but that's a really good example because it shows that it keeps uh, plants in a confined space from uh, becoming contaminated. The process to extract pure carbon um, is difficult and requires a lot. You need an oxygen deprived tank and to subject the material to extremely high temperatures like upward of 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, the carbon is exposed to different chemicals, commonly argon and nitrogen, and again placed in the tank and superheated again to 600 to 1200 degrees Celsius. The second time that the carbon is placed in the heated tank, it's exposed to steam and oxygen. And through that process, um, we're able to increase the surface area of the uh, carbon that's left. Um, one issue with this, in addition to its extremely difficult process, is the fact that uh, one ton of fresh sargassum uh, equals 80 kg of activated carbon, uh, which would be about, well, uh, 8% or something like that. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, these are the uses that we could have for activated carbon if you went through this difficult process of creating it. Uh, water and wastewater treatment, which would be nice for St. Martin because we don't have a wastewater treatment center for more than 60 or 70% of the island. Fleur will know that. Um, she can correct me afterwards. Uh, soil bioremediation, reducing the toxicity of pollutants and contaminated sites, air purification, skin care, personal care products, food and beverage, uh, color correction and beverages, uh, flavor, alcoholic beverages and food additives, things like that. Next slide. I think there's one more. Oh, no, just kidding. That was it. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Activated carbon is definitely a very useful product, but 
yeah, as you said, it takes very high temperatures to make it. So that is kind of a downside. I don't know if how little you get out of it is a downside because it means you can use a lot of sargassum to, to make your product, which could be pos positive if you have too much sargassum on your island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah. So who was looking at bioplastics? That was me, Fleur. Oh, sorry, just then, of course, my daughter tries to break in the door. Um, so I looked into sargassum as a bioplastic. I did not have that much time, so I did try to put something quickly together. Um, I found some studies that were looking at uh, seaweed in general and then more uh, sargassum specifically. And then I kind of went down into that uh, tunnel where you all of a sudden start going into all of these uh, scientific documents like, wait, hold on, uh, focus. So um, I found um, that indeed seaweeds can form films directly or using their derivatives. And um, when doing this directly and without chemical treatment, there is actually um, a promising approach to do so, but it is still relatively new. So they're still looking into a lot of the research into it. It's uh, from a few years ago and you see more and more things coming up about it. Um, and there are quite a few advantages as opposed to other biomass products, as you won't need pesticides, you also don't need wide land use, it grows fast, it's easy to harvest, it's cheap, and you can also mix it with other materials or other types of seaweed um, to improve the characteristics and properties. Uh, so it is a promising approach in, in the sense of replacing conventional plastic as that is not exactly the eco-friendly way to go. Um, and also green production methods uh, seem to be more viable um, also in comparison to conventional extraction and also a more economic and eco-friendly way of uh, treatment. Can you go to the next one? Um, and as plastic is of course a known problem, uh, it is uh, one of the largest parts of our any kind of production that is made for uh, containers, school packaging, and it, it, cr it creates a huge yeah, threat to our natural environment and human health. We've seen that also a lot of times when people have been doing their um, beach surveys for their sargassum, that indeed there's always plastic entangled into it and you see it in the gyres and um, every island, sadly, has a lot to do with uh, the effects of plastic. Um, and this is a nice way to look at an alternative for a renewable plastic, uh, also for a more circular economy and uh, reducing of resource depletion. Uh, it possesses a good film forming property, which is very good for bioplastics. And actually, the one of the sargassums that we find here, the sargassum natans, is that is one of the invasives here. Um, seems to be a very good uh, type of sargassum to actually use for this. Also nice to know is that it actually fully degrades in 14 days. So it's indeed a really good plastic if you compare it to all the other plastics that last forever. Uh, and it's very comparable to for different types of plastics, like HDPE, PETs, and PLA. So that's, what is that? That's number two one and number two plastic and that is number that's seven um it has a high water vapor barrier and a, a better oxygen barrier. I thought that was pretty interesting but i didn't get to go into all the nitty-gritty details but indeed it shows to be a very viable alternative for food packaging even quality and and safety wise so with more research into it i'm sure there's going to be uh, quite some interesting developments regarding sargassum as a bioplastic. Yes, and I think because we are using so much plastic, um, once you crack sargassum as a bioplastic and are able to to produce it at a price that is, you know, comparable or competitive with regular plastic, you have such a big market that you can fill. So this is a very very promising product, I think. Yeah, and even if you can do it on a local scale, I know that some of the French islands had, uh, years ago, I saw that they were producing all kinds of things, but it didn't last. And I think maybe just it wasn't the right momentum, and now there's so much more known. 
that indeed maybe if those initiatives would get restarted that you would have more opportunities as well maybe even for like eu funding and those kind of things so um, maybe they were a little before their time and hopefully that there is indeed a market for it uh, especially because you notice on the islands that a lot more people are becoming more interested in supporting local economy uh, and so maybe it is indeed something that has a future on the islands Yes, and I feel like a lot more people become aware of um, environmentally friendly and sustainable products as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Can I ask a question? Yes. Isn't it that you make the plastic of the sargassum is made out of the lipicid, out of the oils of the sargassum? So you take that out and you use that as the component for the plastic. And because that's what you normally do. The plastics are also normally made out of oil, and then you also use the leafy sheets out of that for the plastic. So what is different for the seaweed that you use then? Because it's also saying that it degrades in 14 days, while no bioplastics don't do that so fast either. There, you know that, why? I didn't get to go into all the detail, but uh, I, it was mostly focused on uh, the, the film that it can create and that that is very similar to plastic. So I, I didn't go into depth with uh, all the, the, the oils that come out of it, but mostly yeah. that it has this film film property. And the alginate, I, as far as I know, it's more a sugar component of the sargassum rather than an oily component. But you can turn sargassum in like an oil base as well to turn it into plastics. We have some um, some collaborators who are looking into this. You have a, with the money from the German government to turn it first into NAFTA, and then from NAFTA it can be turned into long-lasting bioplastics. Exactly. That's also what's done with, with microalgae that you produce microalgae, especially specifically for those uh, lipid seeds, so for the oils and to make the films of that. Yes. That's why I was surprised to hear this is different from the sargassum, but okay, we can find out later. Yeah, and but if you do it with microalgae, um, we talked with the with the podcast to some people who are looking into using microalgae to make bioenergy, so make oil like crude oil, and then from crude oil you can make all kinds of um, oil-based um, gasoline, um, jet fuel, but also potentially um plastics and she told us that if you want to make it out of microalgae which of course has been researched for a long time the really expensive part is growing the microalgae and if you're able to make these things out of sargassum because there is currently so much sargassum that that cost would go down Yeah, and I think this is more also an alternative more to the single-use plastics than the, than the long-term reusable plastics. Yes, I think something that will degrade in 14 days and is a film is is definitely more for single-use. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, what about lubricants? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, good evening. So I did uh, lubricants, surfactants, and adhesives. So um, there is a company, Solizyme, that worked on a few eco-friendly biolubricants for industrial use, for drilling, and for the textile industry. Um, a company called Encapso also developed uh, a lubricant for drilling as well. But Salazime in recent times seems to be moving more toward um, LV based lubricants for food, um, particularly for brewing and wine industries. And this is from the initial phase of grain handling right through to the finished product. Uh, what I thought was interesting is that algae based lubricants. Uh, anti corrosive. So, so I thought that was quite interesting. That is really uh, interesting. So, you could, yeah. 
save your electronics that corrode because of the sargassum with sargassum. <laughs> yeah. So, surfactants. So this was um, my favorite uh, during the research. Um, so, basically, what it is is simply put, it's detergents. Uh, it reduces a product that reduces surface uh, tension. So uh, there's quite a bit of research and um, scholarly data reports on this. Um, but in 2015, BSF and the same company, Salazine, launched a product for soaps and shampoos. And then uh, Folly and Ben Vignu and Sassy, I hope I'm not butchering these names. <laughs> but um, quite a bit of work was done in terms of research, um, particularly for cosmetics, agrochemistry, health, etc. So uh, my wife, um, she, her, one of her hobbies is making soap. So I asked her if she ever thought about using sarcasm mm -hmm. um, in her production. And she said, yes. And she directed me to uh, the fourth one, the Sweetest Dream Seaweed Soap. And also um, lovelygreens.com has a part of the process of developing soap from, from sargasm. So I thought that was really great. So as a, as a follow-up to, to what I found and the information I gathered, because obviously these slides are just a nutshell of what, what I went through. Um, we're going to start doing tests on the sargasm for soap within the next week or two. So nice. Basically, yeah, so basically it's going to be in two parts, um, grinding, grinding fresh sargasm to make like a gel. We're going to try that in portions and then um, using the, the dry sargasm and grinding it to a powder and see, see how both work and then take it from there. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So ad adhesives. Again, quite a lot of research was done on this, um, but mostly for the medical, especially the surgical side of industry. Uh, sealing, surgical sealing, adhesion, even site-specific. Uh, drug deliveries. There's quite a bit of work on that. But he says, I was looking for more for um, like epoxy type adhesives, but I didn't come across anything like that. It was more for, for surgical use. Next slide, please. But that's still really cool. I didn't know you could use algae for that. Yeah. And uh, so, in summary, so I, I went over to the Paris Bay and I got this sample. Uh, how I got it, I had to use my, my fishing rod and fish it in because <laughs> it's very quite difficult to get a fresh sample from that bay right now. So I, ch I checked it to see if it had any of the properties, whether uh, lubrications, surfactant, or uh, adhesive. Uh, to put it simpler, was it oily? Was, was it soapy? Was it sticky? And it had none of that. And by the way, um, it had no thorns and it, on the stem and it had no spines on the bladder, so I assumed it was Nathan's eight. So um, I, had, I, I have a question. Um, does Nathan's one, uh, fourth and three, have any of these of the properties above? And um, I didn't find any of them. The Nathan's one and Floatin's three samples in Anguilla, I, they probably are, but I just didn't find any. But it would be interesting to see if it had any of those properties. Um, I think this, just from looking at the picture, I think this is Nathan's one. Or maybe Nathan's three, but it's, I'm very, very surely probably not Nathan's eight. What do you think, Evelyn? I see Floatin's three. Floatin's three, that's what I meant. Either Nathan's one or Floatin's three. Yeah. Okay. Luton Street. Yeah. Let me let me see. I can zoom the photo more, so I can see. But uh, because of the way it looks, 
like it's chubby. very bushy, right? Yeah. Yes, bushy and chubby. Yes, it's like yeah. fluid and stream. I was looking for the spines on the bladders. I didn't see any, and then I was looking for the thorns on the slam stems. Sometimes yeah. you have to look very close and in all the parts because not all the stems have the spines. Yeah, the oh. thorns. Yes. Okay. Some yeah. some yeah. stems doesn't have a spines, but some does. But if you find just one stem with a spine, then it's fluid and straight. Okay. Yeah, and it is tricky to tell them apart. And looking for the thorns and and, and stuff is really good when you're starting. But once mm -hmm. you once you get an eye for them, you I actually hardly ever look for the thorns anymore because you get an eye for what the what the like the blades or the the leaves look like and the plant itself, and then mm -hmm. just in when you're not unsure, I can check the thorns. Um, yes. In okay. terms of whether or not the other ones are oily, soapy, and, or sticky, um, the fresh sargassum when you just have it in hand, I wouldn't call any of them oily, soapy, and, or sticky. But it does have, like once you treat it, you can get like sticky stuff coming out of it. Like we, I, I remember like you, it can release like very sticky or slimy stuff um, in, um, in water if you, if it's stressed, for example. So yes. it does have internally like the alginates and stuff like that that are sticky that you just would have to get out of the plant. And maybe there are some parts or some sargassum mats that come with a sticky thing, but that's an animal. It's not part of the sargassum. It's an animal doing it, the, uh, the nest where it lives. Actually, it's like, it looks like a worm, but it lives in the ocean, but it's in the sargassum. And the nest of, of the worm are very sticky color uh, white or gray yeah it's and like a sticky was, thing between yes. the different blades you can pull it apart yeah it looks uh awful, awful sometimes and also i made a zoom to your photo and mm -hmm. actually because of the air blades we can see that they are more oval than circle and from that mm -hmm. also you can say that it's fluid and straight okay Good to know. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, but I it, to mention. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's really hard to tell them apart, so don't feel bad if you don't get it right. Yeah, yeah I'm a novice, so I, I don't feel bad. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention that there's one company in Guadeloupe uh, that was doing research on these three areas, uh, software projects. I don't know if they're still the, the research is ongoing, uh, they, but I'll I'll look for more information on it if they published anything. Yeah, that's a good that's find. It. I've never heard of them, and I thought I knew most of the players in the sargassum world. Right. Yeah. But uh, I must say, I was I was happy that I chose uh, lubricants, surfactants, and adhesives because uh, I thought it was quite quite interesting. But has been done so far. That's it is. Yeah. Yeah. What about the animal feed? Good night. Jeffrey. Good night, Jeffrey. Hi, Kevin. Good. Hello. Um, so I did some research. Um, I didn't find too much, but that picture I got a couple slides just to say a few things. So um those four gentlemen are actually um from Jamaica. And they actually started a company, Organic Feed Feeds. They're actually doing um, feed for goats. So they're actually using the sargasm and making it into feed and giving it to the goats. If you go to the next slide, that gentleman there is actually, there's a recent picture of Mr. Morrison. He's actually the CEO of this company. Um, 20, 20, 23, this picture was taken. He's actually looking to do a lot of different things with the sargasm, but he's actually doing a lot of research into it still. So he 
he has some products done, but I've been researching. I haven't seen exactly how he's making them because I think he's trying to keep that to himself a bit. But um, I guess when he evolves everything, he let out everything. But what I did from my end, I still keep researching. So if you go to the next slide, um, I found out that um, sargasm is good for ruminant animals. So basically, these are um, cows, sheep, goats, etc. And um, they are very high in fiber, um, antacids, um, and uh, um, also minerals are found inside of it, which is good for fatty acids. Um, if you go to the next slide, that um, that animal there, you can see the digestion, right? So when they eat this um, sargasm, it actually is good for these animals. And it's saying that it gives better marble of the meat. Um, it's also saying that for it gives better yield of, of, of milk um, and et cetera. But when I did a little more research, if you go to the next slide, um, this is actually like a summary. Um, I wouldn't go through all of it. They just left it there so eventually you guys can read through it. But I think it's a pretty interesting that um, it said a few things. That um, some research is also saying that sometimes some puddles are that they're researching also saying that they can find indigestion of animals are uh, sometimes loss of dust. I, I think because um, probably the sub components of this orgasm are probably not washed correctly or if it's not dealt correctly. So um, lots of research still needs to go into the, the animal feed um, products. So they have people out there looking into it, um, but I think it's a lot of work. Um, as Mr. Morrison said, also is a lot of research. So they're putting together teams and and also they got the government in Jamaica very actively involved in this and the health environment and teams to try to get something done. So I'm thinking in the future, um, they will be probably the first um, island in the Caribbean to actually export this and produce this very widely for the Caribbean. But that's the um, end of my presentation. That's really cool. Um, the only thing we have, you have to be very careful to to do with this because it's feed for animals is to check your sargassum for heavy metals such as arsenic and other things because sargassum in the ocean is a bit like a sponge who takes up a lot of um, bad things which you know cleans the ocean but if we then feed it to animals we have to be sure that it doesn't have too many heavy metals or that we can take those out but he may have found a way to take it out and a lot of people who found ways to take it out, they keep it a secret how they do it because, of course, it helps their business to be successful. Exactly. I think that's what he mentioned in one of his videos, too, that you don't really want to say much of that, um, how he's doing that. But um, eventually, you know, everything will come out to light. So eventually, <clears throat> we find out exactly what he does. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now we go into environmental restoration. So we have somebody from the SEBA team here. Hi there, good evening. Um, so yeah, SEBA environmental restoration. The mangrove, I read a paper where basically they were using it um, as mulch. So they were mixing it uh, with substrates, so mainly sand, and they were trying different percentages and either wet or dry to raise a uh, young mangrove. Um, and they realized that um, using the drier mulch, it actually worked really well to start out the baby mangrove. And so that's kind of like an easy use where you can collect it um, from the environment and then put it to work um, towards species that you actually want to expand like mangrove. So that was nice to see that um, you're able to use the sargassum in that way. And the, of course, the heavy metal um, was brought up, but they found that uh, the mangrove were not uptaking it too much. And so it can be something that can be used um, in the long run. That's really sure. cool. Yeah. Uh, and then Jethro has a, another slide. Yeah. yeah. So I looked into the second part of the environmental restoration, which was um, climate change mitigation. Um, and then as I was looking into it, I realized that I watched a whole hour and a half video 
um, mm -hmm. that you guys made that was effectively this slide. Um, and so um, I kind of looked into it a little bit more, but without, I mean, without going crazy, because those who watch the video have already heard quite a lot about it. Um, <laughs> but I kind of took the three questions. I said, well, how is it made? And it's in quotations because it's not really a made product. But um, for example, you can sink sargasm um, to the deep sea um, or you can use it for long life products. Um, and so um, there was also the possibility of growing sargasm and sinking it, um, which to me started feeling a lot like uh, um, iron fertilization. That was a, a big trend a little while back. Um, and doing that kind of thing, but targeting sargasm instead of other um, algaes or, or uh, phytoplanktons. Um, some examples of companies that are making the product. Um, one that was listed was SOS Carbon Project. Um, and when I went to their website and I really started looking at how they were using it kind of for, um, you know, like sinking it or carbon capture, um, they only had a small little... Uh, blurb about it on their website and it was basically like yeah we've done this in the past contact us if you um have you know would like some solutions to capture some carbon um so i didn't really get very far looking at exactly what they're doing maybe they did it a little bit they're not doing a lot of it um seemed like they were focusing on um even sarcasm for other things um and then i started thinking um you know, what what else what are some other examples of companies that are making the product um and i think a lot of the things we're talking about today um but especially the one that we've talked about a few times which is like the construction bricks because one thing that was mentioned in the video is it has to last a long time um in order to be kind of uh you know to sink the carbon um and something like construction bricks would be the one item i can really think of that would you know, sink that in there for a long time because they should be durable. They should be heavy duty. Um, and in theory, you want to build a house that that stands. So um, and then what do we want to be aware of when making this product? Um, that question was like, I don't know, 45 minutes of the video. Um, so <laughs> basically, I said, um, simply put, it's an unbelievable number of unknowns. Um, you know, we're sinking other nutrients. Uh, there's lots of costs involved. Um, we have no idea a lot of the environmental outcomes that there could be. Um, so I think that they said um, monitoring, somebody in that video said monitoring, monitoring, we've got to monitor, change things if necessary, um, and watch what happens. Um, but of course, there are positives, um, and that things like preserving seagrass core areas and then helping the tourism sector, as well as, of course, um, mitigating climate change and um, sinking uh, or uh, sequestering carbon so yeah yeah so um just a, a little note on sos carbon they in 2019 they did a trial where they were sinking sargassum using their method of pumping it to a depth that then sinks it by itself mm -hmm. um but after that i think they they wrote a paper um gray et al that showed that you know, unless like the the cost of actually getting the methodology, the verification is quite high. And if you're doing it as a single company, they they say, you know, like you first need to have like the the market is not ready for was not ready for what they were doing. So then they they pivoted a bit towards sargassum management using um the the boats with the with the circular attachments to the boats and and giving jobs to fishermen but they're still like uh, i'm i'm good uh, i i i often talk to andres who is this kind of running the company and they're definitely still interested in that field but same as the the startup i work for sea fields and others um, running tide who's doing this type of thing with kelp and there's um, seaweed generation who's also trying to do this with sargassum we are we all still first have to do environmental impact assessments of what's happening at the deep sea before we can start this that being said in um martinique the um, the government actually let a company sink sargassum to a thousand meters depth 
not to get carbon credits, but just because I think they run out of dump sites on land and they're now dumping in the in the deeper sea, which is a, is a quite interesting concept, but without the environmental impact assessment, also quite risky. But it shows also a bit the desperation of, of the region or that, yeah, it is it is a really difficult problem to deal with the sargassum and, and finding places to, to store it if you, if you cannot make products out of it. Could be the way that we discover um, what happens when it gets put into the deep sea. Yes, if we ever get the money together to go and look what happens to their, um, their um, deposits. But yeah, hopefully we do. Um, we we at Seafields and Running Tide we we sunk one one bale of sargassum and some kelp in the deep sea in Norway in a in an area that is surveyed every year by the Alfred Wegener Institute. So by next year summer we will know what happened to that. But we we didn't have the budget or the time to. To, to to attach all the cameras and all the sensors you need to do a proper environmental impact assessment. So we we're, we're still hoping to start doing that in December. Um given that we get the funding and the permits to do so. Francisca, perhaps an ignorant question, but as it is a normal pr process, it was always in the Saragossa uh, ocean uh, yeah. to have this uh, this uh, Saragossa. It always well, dug, dug down into the deep ocean. We have never seen any environmental issues coming out of there. Why all of a sudden would you expect any environmental issues? And I mean, the ocean is enormous and this yes. is a, a natural process. So, um, you, I don't, you, it's mostly because the quantity is increased. So, you you because you may be dumping more in the same spot than naturally would sink in a single spot. That is why you need to do an environmental impact assessment because you know sargassum came naturally in small amounts to the beaches of the Caribbean for thousands of years, and now that the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is here you suddenly have a lot more sargassum on the beach and it is a catastrophe. However, I don't think there's going to be major negative impacts on the deep sea if you are careful at not putting it on top of like one of those hot spots, you know, like the, the black smokers or any other place that is really teeming of life and very delicate. But the deep sea is, is a delicate place. And it's a place that we don't know that much about. Plus, you don't only need to know what happens to the deep sea, but you also need to know how fast the sargassum degrades down there in order to make claims about your carbon credits. So does the sargassum, does the sargassum get eaten by bacteria and animals quite fast? And after a year, it's, you know, half of it is gone. Or after a year, you hardly see anything gone. That will determine how long your carbon credits last. Because as long as the the sargassum is down there, not eaten, the carbon is in the sargassum. And then when it gets eaten, then the carbon goes into the water. And then depending on how deep you are, it will take X hundred years to get back to the surface on average. So, but if it's in the sargassum, it potentially could be stored for millennia or permanently, like it could get into the sediment and become oil again and be and stay down there as an oil deposit if we're not touching it. Yeah, well, okay, great. So if you're spreading it, and, and, and again, I would say just go down a little bit in the uh, Saragossa or uh, sea and you will find all your answers uh, because it's there for a long time. Perhaps yes. a little bit too simplistic, but quite effective. Yes, but you you also know, like maybe some of you have have seen the the stories about deep sea mining and other things. Um, if you don't do things right and you don't do it robustly with environmental impact assessments, you soon could have 
NGOs and nature NGOs um, really against your idea and and doing a lot and pretty much shutting you down like a, as in a social license so you need to do it right or or you will there will be people who are very critical who will tell you that what you're doing is not okay so growth substrates Oh, I like the photo here. Yes, this it's is nice. one. And it has a lot of stuff growing on it. Yes, hydroids everywhere. And algae. Yeah. So who's Hope the internet on... is up. Chris, you're presenting? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so growth substrates, agricultural commodities. Um, which you looked at um, being able to grow mushrooms mm -hmm. on uh, the um, on the sagasum using different components. So mushrooms has been grown on straws, coconuts, um, coffee grind, and they say that it was actually used um, on the seaweed. Next slide. And that was interesting, oh, so I put it. Okay, so commercially, um, with the sagasum, there's a biostimulator that is made. So we have a company, um, a young guy from St. Lucia, in Algas, he makes this um, plant tonic. And basically, it's a combination of the fermentation. That's what actually happens that activates um, molecules and help with the growth of plants that actually um, penetrates the plant's cell membranes. And we've been able to remove a lot of the toxic or the heavy metal um, within that to actually, um, this has been extracted from the seaweed, which will, um, also helps when it's added to the environment that it does not have these um, toxins. Or heavy metals. These are some other um, places that I've found. So they actually have other areas in the Caribbean, such as Barbados, um, in Antigua, and I think Mexico also. So these mm -hmm. um, different fertilizer is being made biosimilant for plants. So um, we realize that it's been some of the this plant, this is actually being used here because we've always been speaking about from an environmental background that we do, and we need to go green. We need to find things in the, within the environment that does not add too much toxin or heavy chemicals within um, the the and the plants that we consume when we grow in the plants. So seeing that the sagasum has been used for this and the heavy metal is being extracted was quite a bit of very insightful. Yes, and I think fertilizer is the most widely made product out of sargassum. I think that's where there's the most companies that are successful and that stay, that stay in business for a while. Um, the only thing is you have to find a way to get rid of the arsenic, but I think there are yeah. several options to do so. But of course, not, none of the companies like to share how they do it. Yes, yes, that's what I found out when I was researching. You could not go, you would not get the actual process on how they actually remove the toxin. In all of the reading that I did, they just said that it's extracted, but do not yeah. explain how it is being done. Yes, but it is it is a really cool product, and as you said, like often for fertilizer, we are using chemically produced fertilizer, which is made out of rocks or other things, and then that fertilizer washes off into the ocean, and we get more nutrients in the ocean where it's not needed, where the sargassum keeps growing because of those extra nutrients, and the, the coral reefs are dying. So taking those nutrients from the sargassum and using them on the field so that at least we're not introducing new stuff, but we're kind of circling it um, will be very beneficial. That's 
Thank so, you. Nora, tell us about the shoes. Hello. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, yeah. Let me see. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Can you hear? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I was uh, researching about a company in Mexico, Renovare. Oh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but um, see, since um, here on Aruba, I don't know product. I heard about something that there is a production of soap, but anyway, I went for the foodware. And they're uh, specialized in making shoes um, already before, but now they um, started with a sarcasm product. And um, if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, okay. So how does it start? What the process of the production of this is, of course, the material collection. So... Um, they um, they basically use plastic bottles and they use sargassum seaweed, which is collected uh, on the coast of Cancun. It gets dried and the excess sand is removed. And uh, then they transport it to Lyon and it gets crushed and integrated with the poly polymers, or how you say it. And... Um, then the seaweed is incorporated with the plastic and um, introduced to the injection machine. So Renovara also innovated production in the market by changing um, the traditional glue and made uh, from soluble and integrated water-based glue in its processes. So that means it's also, um, yeah, eco-friendly sort of and not so aggressive to the workers and um, in the end also to the one who's using the shoe, right? Um, about the material anal analysis, um, they collected the sargassum seaweed and analyzed it um, in the laboratory for around three months and determining uh, that they needed seven, um, 600 milliliter PET bottles for cutting 100 grams of sargas and seaweed into it for the sole of the shoe. Well, and then the next step would be then, of course, the design of the shoe, which uh, logic is, yeah. And then the fourth part would be then the additive application, which is water-based or eco and water-friendly, as I mentioned before. Um, then uh, they have the quality control. Uh, the shoes underwent like 50 resistance tests uh, to verify the, the durability because what does it matter if they do a eco-friendly shoe which is broken after two weeks of wearing it. So the, they made sure that it will be, yeah. And I, I read something like that those shoes in average could last years. I don't know. It depends on who works. And then mm. in the end comes the distribution. What I found very nice is so the pricing of the shoe is reasonable. Um, it varies from 800 to um, 3,400 pesos, which I don't know if I'm wrong, but I thought it was around $65 per pair of shoe which is a good price. I think everybody can afford that more or less. And that they do 10% of their income is um, dedicated to supporting social organizations and cleaning the ocean in, among others. So they have um, a very nice system of giving back to society. Okay? And this company, of course, created jobs in their region, which is also impacted by the sargasm because they are also relying on tourism and people lost their work because of that maybe and could and settle into a different area. Um, I don't know. Next slide. Is there? Yeah. So that is the website basically of the company. And you see also that they have, for example, they have two types of shoes. One is like this heavy 
blue tissue, which is probably for more working kind of environment or hiking or whatever. And um, the other one is then a very light and corded kind of shoe. And you can then choose whatever color you like. It's, it's very nice. The only thing is the website is only in Spanish. So um, it's not yet um, worked out for the world market, let's say. And I found um, in the end of it also this website, Aim to Flourish. They have also a very nice um, description of the process of the, the shoe. So if you're interested, if I'm not um, giving enough information, uh, you can go on that website and read the process again very good. Yeah, that's what I um, found out. And um, what to be aware of, I guess, like with all the other products, is the arsenic. Um, I didn't find on the website and on the description um, that they um, work on distracting those kind of things, but I assume that because else, um, yeah. They're working in the two and three already a long time, so they have in other materials also to think about what people can wear and if it's healthy or not. Yeah. I don't know. Um, is that okay? Yeah, yes. that's perfect. And these are the shoes you are going to experience. But a new, oh, really? <laughs> yes. yes a, new, a new line of shoes, actually. We were saying at the beginning that you are going to be the one to to start using the next innovation of Renovare of mm -hmm. shoes called mm -hmm. Aqua Shoes. Yeah, yeah. They are so yes. These are the shoes you are going to receive, hopefully. Nice. nice. Yes. Yes. And there's there's actually. At least in Mexico, there's two other companies that started doing shoes. I think one uh, is going to be presented a little bit later as well, which is like a student from Merida who makes like kind of like vegan leather type shoes. And then we have, we've also seen some newspaper articles, but I couldn't find the company's website or anything that makes the type of sandals that are kind of foam-based sandals that are really in in um, in trend, trendy right now. You, you probably all know what I'm talking about. Yes. I also look for it and, and didn't found it. Yes, but there are, there are even more companies that make shoes as well or make shoes type products. Yes, mm -hmm. one of the things of the, the CEO told us Fran and me that it's difficult to do this process inside a in, inside the machines that you use another kind of plastics because our gasum has a lot of water so you have to find the correct formulation with plastic and sargassum to do to find the attachment of all the the products and the mix and to to do the to do the shoe actually so he he was telling us that it's not as easy as it may look like but even though they are they are trying hard to do this fast for us <laughs> nice yeah. so the next product is looks like Soaps, I really liked your slide and your approach. I think this is really important. Yeah, um, when, when we were in the last meeting, I, I put in the chat, I would like to look into the cosmetics, but then someone else took that. Um, so I thought I'd do a little bit of a different approach. Maybe you can put Nora on silent. Haim, can you do that? Yeah, um, so I'm used not to think as much in products, but more in customers. So what do customers want? Because we can make a product, and, and but if we don't sell it, we will not make any money. And since we are in an area where we do have a, a limited amount of sargassum coming in, 
and it's uh, quite uh, uh, unstable with respect to how much is coming in. And I see only limited use for the local market. But what all islands of the Caribbean have in common is, is that we are in tourism industry. And so we have usually more tourists coming in than people living on the islands. So if you look at that perspective, you would say, okay, what are tourists taking home? And that's souvenirs. Um, and it's not only to have the tourists uh, taking away the souvenirs, but also to have the locals and the tourists creating awareness with respect to uh, the problem of sargassum and climate change and, and the changing world as a whole. Uh, so I see that that souvenirs are not yet considered as being a category and, and you can take different products, put them together in the shop and say, okay, this is all um, a product that relates to, for example, invasive species. Uh, I was in New Zealand and they have this, this possum over there. So they sell different products related to that possum. And I was ac actually triggered by one word and that was the word jewelry. So I, I looked into... Um, What's that? Huh? So are they making jewelry out of uh, sargassum? And yes, that's what they do. I mean, you don't need a lot of material. So with a, a limited influx, you can already have a product, you can sell the product and you can create awareness. And so that's the one possibility. And then um, the next slide, um, I uh, we had Kaya Kaya this weekend, which is a big street event. And um, uh, one of the persons I know very well is, is Lisanne Keus, and she is the lionfish girl. So lionfish um, is quite beautiful on the water, and you can use it for its meat, and it, it's not uh, toxic uh, if you take out the spines. Um, but you can also make quite nice jewelry out of it. And she has made it her business to uh, sell the meat in a restaurant, and also make jewelry out of it. And now she's expanding, for example, to Colombia, not as much for the fish, um, uh, but more for the jewelry. And so, so if you could combine that, you could have like a, uh, a souvenir shop where you sell uh, products from invasive species. And so think about the customer instead of the product. And if you look then to the products of, of Sargassum, you could um, you can see quite some interesting products. Um, we already had soap, or we will get soap. Uh, if you are the soap business, you're quite close to the candle business. I'm used to making soap and candles myself, so you can do that as well. Uh, any other cosmetic things uh, made of of sargassum? I found this T-shirt, not the gasm I was expecting, um, and then. Uh, uh, the shoes that we are going to wear, biodegradable plates. And I remember uh, a friend of mine, Wiebe uh, Koistra, uh, who was a uh, uh, fan of macroalgae, and he made like this kind of art things. So he went to Helgoland, took algae with them, dried them, and made beautiful art with that. So that would be also the stuff I saw things like notebook gift wrapping. Uh, so I think there will be. Uh, quite some opportunities if you put the different products together and then uh, make a souvenir stand out of that uh, for all the Caribbean islands. I guess that was the final slide. Yes. Yep. Yes, so that's uh, my contribution for today. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea and it can be combined with other products that may be less sexy and less sellable, but which will make your company or your your initiative more known and more talked about if somebody wears your sargassum earrings or or has your t-shirt or your shoes or or painting up and their friend asks them about it they, then you will be talked about even if you have a product that is maybe a fertilizer or a biofuel or something that maybe isn't something that is so nice to look at yeah, it's a story that sells. Exactly. Good evening, Julie. Is this yours? Yeah, yeah, this is me. Um, wastewater treatment and sargasm. Definitely not on the sexy list. <laughs> um, while I do not believe that this is like the, um, maybe the most um, 
like making the most use of the resource of sargasm. Um, as I said back in the beginning, I'm in sustainable waste disposal and the nuisance has created a need to dispose of it. And like you say, in some countries, they're just dumping it offshore and sinking it because they don't have any more landfill space. Um, sargasm and treating wastewater, like in tertiary systems, the sargasm itself has been like tested in lots of different experiments and studies around the Caribbean, um, with the biggest thing being that the methane potential is really not there, not what they thought it would be considering the sugars that are in um, sargasm. <clears throat> with this being said, like most small island nations, um, tertiary treatment of our sewage um, doesn't happen in effective manners in many ways. And use of anaerobic digestion to take care of that problem, we can solve the second problem of the disposal of the sargasm by providing, by using um, pre-processing techniques like microwave technology and all kinds of other good stuff that's out there with heat and pressure and stuff like that, you can actually derive um, what, um, at least I believe, and a couple scientists I know, to be viable um, products like alginates, um, things that can be used for making um, fake plastic, silverware, etc. Plus, also composite materials that you can use in building products, and having the sargasm inside of your wastewater treatment and your anaerobic digester adds additional nutrients um, and other components to your affluent at the end that can be used for agricultural use. So I kind of find it to be like, well, I love all the other stuff and the great products that like we've seen. It's um, it's very like functional and practical. On Virgin Gorda, we um, we dump our sewage on the side of a mountain. And by making it be a system that the government can support financially or that um, the UK can support because it's an overseas territory, it handles both sewage as a tertiary treatment and this nuisance that everybody likes to call sargasm. Um, issues with it, there's no funding at all of anybody who wants to do a little bit of experiments with sargasm really, or none that I find at least in the British Virgin Islands, um, to test the products to see that you have viable commercial products through the AD process and pre-processing. Um, <laughs> The, it takes away the issue of the the influx amounts because it doesn't matter. So you just need some funding to do your recipe research so that you know that you can properly process your wastewater, hopefully gain some methane so that you can power your wastewater system. And um, yeah, what I feel to be a very viable option for disposing of sargasm at this point in time, because it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of effort to produce all these different products. So that's my um, spiel on wastewater. As far as bioremediation, I really find it interesting some of the things that they're doing in Punta Cana and the DR. And they are doing things over there where they're doing with all the golf courses they have over there and to try to remediate the issues that um, come with fertilizers, et cetera, off of golf courses and the runoff using phyto remediation where they plant um, coastal plants, which will start to take out some of the nitrates and the phosphorus and phos phosphates rather <clears throat> um, that come as runoff and they're actually deploying like blooms of living sargasm like on the inside of a barrier to further purify the water that runs off from these areas it's all like just they're just trying it or talking about trying it so i'm really curious to see how that works out and then they're also talking about the use of aquatic booms that actually contain sargasm so that they absorb the issue with the 
sargasm absorbing all the, the toxins is then what do you do with it? And biofuel seems to be the most um, constant suggestion or solution as an end thing. So then we're back to the um, collecting it and getting it to process and all the cost involved with that and which form is best, living, wet, dead, on the beach, rotten. Um, and lots of interesting work with deploying booms and using actually suction to suck the sargasm that piles up behind booms into biofuel facilities to try to make actual biofuels as in synthetic gasoline, et cetera, from the product. So there's lots of things happening, but all of it requires money and science. And so it's a really slow slog, but um, very practical solutions to the issue of how much sargasm we have or think we may have to dispose of. That's pretty much it. Oh, and I did do my land experiment. Um, I didn't get any pictures because it rained on my dry stuff, but the dried sargasm worked very well at absorbing um, spilt waste vegetable oil. The wet made kind of a really gooey mess. And all of it, I threw in my little biodigester that I throw organics into and make methane to power a furnace to smelt metals. So yeah, um, wastewater and bioremediation, thanks. Very cool, Julie. Um, just Thank to you. add to this, um, we interviewed Ligina Henry from Barbados. She's a researcher there a few, now almost a few years back, I guess in 2022, I guess. And um, she looked into using the wastewater from rum distilleries. And she found that that wastewater is really good um, to make biogas. And they actually started, they started off with like salt shaker big um, um, little experiment. So they could really have a lot of experiments running at the same time. So in terms of funding, you know, to, to test the different things. They were testing it in small batches. And then once they found the good combination, they went into a bigger one. And they you can remodel cars quite easily to run on biogas. And in Barbados, they already have a, a, like a, a pipeline system for biogas because a lot of people use it for cooking and stuff. So she is really hoping that they can turn Barbados fossil fuel free by using all the sargassum that gets into their waters and 80% of the wastewater from um, the rum distilleries and potentially also other wastewater to to make um, um, gas uh, biogas for driving cars. So it definitely is a is a very promising way of using sargassum. And I didn't know that in Punta Cana they were um, experimenting with using sargassum to take out nutrients and other pollutants from the water, but that's always something I wanted to to look into myself. And I guess I have to I have to send Jake Keel, who is the head of the Sustainability um, Punta Cana Foundation, an email asking how he's doing with that because that really interests me. So, Martin, anti-fouling. Yeah, I saw also in a chat comment from Jerome that he's back. You can also do first Jerome and then me, but I don't mind. Let's do that, yes. Let's go. Hi, sorry hey. about that. No worries. Uh, let's see. I think um, the page before is also mine. Uh, probably is. Yes. Yes. So I um, did the pharmaceutical and biomedical parts, specifically the polysaccharides. Um, from sargassum, you can create so a lot of pharmaceutical and biomedical products. Um, you can think of anti-cancers, antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, antibacterials, and antiviral drugs. 
they're created with the polysaccharides that are extracted from sargassum species, specifically the sulfated polysaccharides or SPs. Um, next page, please. Um, SPs can be found within the cell walls of sargassum as well as other macroalgae. They're normally harvested by suitable extraction or precipitation methods. And honestly, um, here is where I kind of got a bit lost because I wasn't sure, at least if I'm looking at everybody else's presentation, I feel like I focused mostly on how to get the polysaccharides, but I'm not sure if I understood the um, assignment entirely. No, that's perfect. I think for some products it's it's not as easy to find out how it's made and for others it's easier so that's probably All why right. some people didn't didn't cover it as much okay well yeah so in essence in order to get these sulfated um, or sps um from the sargassum um you first want to have it clean and then you use the suitable extraction or precipitation method then it's followed by purification, characterization, and biological studies. Here in this image, you can see an example of um, how, yeah, in the cleaning part of the um, sargassum, they either come in powder form or just a freshly washed or um, cleaned um, piece of sargassum. And then it's um, it can be extracted by um, either using enzymes or um, boiling it with hot water. And then here they don't show the step where it's purified, but oftentimes um, some acetone, for example, would be tossed in there. So that way all the lipids can break down as well. And then it's characterized as well. And... Here in this example, they're characterized based on biological features such as, um, I can't even read, but um, one second. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's um, characterized by antioxidant, anti-cancer, antiviral, antibacterial, and anticoagulant. And you can see here that biological studies doesn't just go for pharmaceuticals or biomedical, but also for um, nutraceuticals, um, nutrition in general, so functional foods, and also the um, cosmetics industry. Um, next slide, please. Um, in another uh, research, they also created like a general um, conceptual model or process to show how they did it. And here they just generally um, made sure that the sargassum was nicely washed or perfectly washed of all the salts. And then it was extracted using um, other um, methods with also hot water, um, alkaline products, acetone, fractionation, ethanol precip and precipitation, microwave proteolysis. There's a lot of um, methods actually for extraction. And with purification as well, there are also different um, ways of purifying it, with just um, and not just by using acetone for the lipids. And characterization as well as just to see if there are any impurities or if there are other um, ingredients mixed in with the SPs. And then they continue study. Um, using hydrolysis, you break it down from polysaccharides to monosaccharides. So that's basically breaking up the large chain. And then using that to study further and its applications in the biomedical and pharmaceutical fields. And that's about everything. I hope that this more or less gives an idea of how um, SPs are derived from sargassum. That's really interesting. And I remember I talked to somebody who made fui content from sargassum. So 
one of these antiviral, anti everything, um, um, you know, food adjectives like a take your daily vitamin type thing. And he said that he he use he doesn't he doesn't put made from sargassum on his bottle because people have so many negative connotations with sargassum and with the smell yeah. and how it is on the beach. So that he he writes on it made from brown seaweed because otherwise it doesn't sell. So that was really important insight. Um, also, other people told me with their fertilizers, um, Salgax, who works out of um, the Yucatan, they said they had to do a whole campaign of of telling people that sargassum can also be good because uh, a lot of people have very negative connotations with sargassum and, and, and put these negative connotations sometimes also towards products made from them, which of course... It has no reason why they should have negative connotations with the product. No, exactly. Like I noticed as well when I was researching it that there were a lot of um, categorization. They don't specifically mention which kind of um, macroalgae they were using. It was always or red or green or brown. Yeah, and maybe they're also using a mix of different algae. Yeah, that's, that's also very big. Yes. All right. Martin. Sorry, I had to find my mouse back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, Anti-fouling. Why did I uh, choose this subject? Because I think it is a subject that is not much heard of and not many people are considering anti-fouling and, and, and uh, so. sargassum or whatever. So, and I also believe that to find interesting subjects, you need to find niche markets because in the way in the mainstream, it's very hard to break in. So you have to find uh, solutions that have an added value that are very specific, and then you can make a product that really can enter into that market. So anti-fouling is a market that is very specific. Uh, we all probably know, of not many people know it probably, is that... Um, all the hulls of boats, all the, 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 the everything that you put into water will be fouled. So there will be growing of, 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 of uh, uh, mussels, of, of, of uh, wheat or whatever. And that is very, very uh, damaging to, especially to ships. And if you look to, for example, uh, if you use this, or if you get a lot of extra uh, growing on your hull, then your uh, fuel consumption will grow with 40% or whatever. So. Fouling, anti-fouling is very important. And that's why it's done. There is uh, also a problem with uh, species that are transported from one area to the other area, and that will be uh, invasive. So that's also why uh, all these ships have to be uh, uh, protected against that. Now, they used for in the past uh, a lot of uh, very nasty chemical products for that, DBTs, etc. They, at a certain moment, said, no, 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 that's too bad for the oceans. So let's uh, use something more friendly than most of the paints are used with copper. The copper is also not that nice. <laughs> so it's a heavy metal and it's also going into the ecosystems. So they are looking for alternatives. But yeah, that's not happening at a lot at the moment. So they're looking now to uh, biological anti-fouling uh, ingredients. And then they came also to sargassum. So is that an option? That was the, the, the question. And how do you use it if you, if you want to do it well? Anti-fouling is most of the time done by painting hulls. So, and also the other materials that go into the water, so it's not only hulls. So what they do is they need to have uh, the sargassum into the paint if it's uh, successful. Then what they found is that in uh, sargassum, there is, like in many other uh, biological uh, species, they have an uh, an anti-fouling, um, how do you call it, microorganism uh, into their surfaces. So that uses, they use that as a natural barrier to have fouling on themselves. So uh, whales, uh, fish, and, and the bigger ones, but also plants, they have that. And sargassum has that too. So they found out 
that the specifics uh, of uh, specifically the sargassum uh, granifuberum, as far as I've uh, pronounced it right, has a huge uh, range of antifouling properties. So they started to do all kinds of experiments with that. They uh, dried the, the sargassum, they, they freeze dry it, and then they grind it so they have a powder. And that powder then will be mixed with the paint that's going onto the hulls. So it's quite easy to do, uh, and, it, and it is very effective. So at that moment, they said, okay, let's let's look further into this. This is a biological uh, 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 treatment, so this is not as uh, uh, harmful as all the other ones. So let's see if we can move it. This is, by the way, only done since the last two, three, four years. Uh, we don't see uh, solutions for this before because the market is very, very traditional. Uh, the maritime market, if you have something, people will not change easily. So they, they started to introduce this, but you, at least I, I couldn't find anywhere on a commercial scale uh, a paint that is using sargassum or any anti uh, uh, fouling system with a biological uh, background. So there's a way to go. And that is a very interesting thing because it is a, a market that has very high added value. So you don't need enormous amounts, but on the other hand, you need sufficient amounts of, of uh, sarcasm to, to fill this market gap. Um, it is also a useful product because you can dry if you harvest it in the Caribbean, in the areas where you where you where, where this uh, this moment uh, creating all the trouble. You can dry, you can freeze dry it quite easily, and then you have the powder, and the powder can then be transported because those uh, um, these, these paints are most of the time made either in the US or in, in Europe or in Asia, uh, where they have big factories for that. So that then you can transport the product easily over there, so that you don't have to set up this this uh, this uh, paint factories in in the Caribbean. So that is also very interesting to see, and I was a little bit surprised that. It didn't pick up that fast as I had expected, because again, it is really effective. They found out that it is, uh, in all the cases, at least as effective as the, the current used paint. And in many uh, times it was even better uh, and had more protective because there's a broader range of, of protecting. Um, so what I think that is missing here, and this is because you see it, it was also in the, uh, in the videos that you showed, the, the seaweed, sargassum, it doesn't have uh, an appealing, uh, in, in principle, it's not only the appealing factor, it's also the unknown factor. People have no clue about it, what it is. And if you need investments for that, then they will say seaweed. What the heck? Why would I invest in seaweed and then especially seaweed? And then on a hull of a boat, that is just the contrary because <laughs> it will grow. So to explain that and to get money for that is the, uh, that's what I assume is the biggest bottleneck. So to make this a product that would be successful, uh, you need a uh, yeah an innovator that is really seeing the potential of it and, and will jump on the opportunity and start producing it because market is there, there is value in the product, uh, it is uh, in, in in a sustainable way uh, also a very uh, good advance. So there is no reason for not doing it, but the current status is that it's nowhere yet. That's it. Yeah. Very interesting. And it kind of makes sense that sargassum is good at anti-fouling because living at the top of the surface like a boat, it wants not other algae and other things to grow on it. So there is always other things that do grow on the sargassum, but if it didn't have this anti-fouling properties, it probably would be even more overgrown. So it, it kind of is like the natural boat in that sense that it, you know, it in order to still be able to to not be overgrown completely by other algae and other animals, it needs to have these properties. Yeah. And it's also, that's probably also the reason why it has such a wide range of uh, properties of, of protecting uh, against all kinds of invasive uh, species that is only growing on them. So that's why it's probably much more effective than, for example, only the copper that they use at the moment and, and, and other uh, chemical products that they use. So, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Papers. Oscar. Hello. 
um, yeah, I have paper. That's what I'm here to talk about. So next slide, please. Um, so the process of um, creating paper from sargasm is essentially it's um, collected and then it's dried over uh, usually a couple of days. And then you have to treat it to get rid of the smell just because of the um, uh, like decomposing um, organisms inside of it. And then it's it's uh, crushed into a pulp and then that um, and then cellulose is mixed into the pulp to give the um yeah to give it structure and then that can be put into a um, paper machine and then turn into paper um in terms of oh yeah, yeah next oh and that um link in the bottom is just the yeah the link in the bottom is just um that's just someone making sargasm if you want to watch it later it's like 10 minutes long yeah and then um so so for the advantages and challenges that i found um from uh like a creativity and graphic design aspects. I thought that um because it can you can use it like the sargon has a very unique texture. And so you can just yeah, that just has uh it's interesting aesthetics which could be potentially exploited. Um and then there's the I guess the obvious removal of sargasm from the beaches. And then yeah, it's more sed um sustainable than traditional paper where with uh traditional paper you're um yeah it's kind of bad for a variety of reasons but mostly just because uh you're using the same plant and it's usually not native and then um i forgot it's like a homogenized single plant species that's just bad for the diversity in the area so by using sargasm you're um yeah reducing the amount of interruption in um other ecosystems and then for challenges, I thought probably one of the biggest challenges that you'd face in this is just having to compete with uh, regular paper. I don't really see how, I don't see it viable on like an extremely large scale. However, um, like just listening to other people talk about the potential tourism aspects, I think that'd be a like an interesting gimmick where you uh, sell where the pitch is that your um, paper is made of orgasm or made of seaweed. I think that could actually sell pretty well. Um, oh, yeah. And then it's also quite limited compared to um, regular paper. As far as I could tell, um, the sargasm derived paper was like a lot. Um, yeah, it was a lot less, a lot less flexible. So you could, it was mainly used for like the covers of books and also in cardboard, or it can really be used for um, regular writing. Paper. So that was, um, yeah, pretty, I guess, big um, yeah, downfall of it, disadvantage of it. Um, and then the sourcing, I can I also see that as a bit of a problem just because it's it's uh, either extremely destructive to um, the beaches or it's um, extremely labor intensive if you're doing it um, yeah, carefully. But yes, yeah, so uh, next Oh, yeah, and these were just the examples of um, successful um, sargasm-based products. Um, the first, yeah, the first two are um, both based in Mexico, and they are, they're pretty similar in terms of um, just the overall product. And then the Sargassi project, um, they uh, what differentiated them to me was that, as far as I could tell, they are, basically they're kind of like a, a middleman in a way where they make they convert the sargasm into the um into the pulp um but then they don't actually make it into paper but they do they do still um they make cardboard with it but they don't make paper with it um but then like the idea is they make the pulp and then they would um get uh uh second another an another company to then manufacture that in the paper that can be used and yes, that is it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Oscar. We did um, interview somebody from the Sargas project. He's from St. Bart's. It was an interview in French. And he also told us that the sargassum paper um, is water resistant and fire resistant. 
So I've yet to try it, especially the water resistant part would maybe make it good for using on the water to take notes, which is always a type of paper that the yeah. scientists need. Or if you yeah, yeah if you were working in the field. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that'd be that'd be really interesting. Oh, that'd be really helpful just yeah, for diving and taking notes with that. So yeah, so I, I'm I'm curious to to get some sargassum paper in my hands and then put it on the water to see how it works. Yeah, it'd be interesting to that'd be interesting to test it, especially yeah. the um, fire resistance. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know I don't know about the practicality of that, but it'd still be interesting. Well, especially for cardboard and stuff, it could be useful. If it's a bit fire resistant or or completely, they so they make bath bars, which not only highlights the wonder of sargassum, but also is a tourism product. So this is a very good product um, to show that you can sell to tourism. And I know and uh, we tried to get them on the podcast, but um, I we haven't had any luck. But they definitely are very much coming from the chemistry. Um, they have chemistry um, backgrounds and they really are looking into this like a bit of a lab way of like they had a, have a lab set up to figure out how to do this and, you know, to test their products as well for arsenic and other things. So, and it sounds like their different bars are are named after different bays in Barbados. I've never been to Barbados, but it does kind of sound like they had they're given them local names as well. And just to make it easier with the slides and stuff, we're gonna talk about the questions first from the videos, but then I also have Rose has sent me her presentation via email. So we'll get to Rose at the end after the questions. Okay. Well, we have three questions in the questionnaire. And one of the first one was mention and explain one of the key challenges in a sargassum business. And I took an answer of the questionnaires from one of you that I thought it was complete and I think it exposes mostly all the things and the hurdles to achieve this kind of business. Uh, one, one of these hurdles is the time of sargassum influx, the uncertainty. So it is not clear when you have a material to process. Variability of the species and morphotypes they have different chemical composition. Fresh water is expensive on Iceland's to wash away the salt. This is an important thing. Ash content can be a problem for some uses due to a lot of variation. The storage, harvest, and transport is costly and needs specialized equip equipment. Taking sand on the beach and damage to the environment Permits are hard to get since there is no often no regulation. You need a market for the products. It's a big challenge. So I think this answer covers all the hurdles. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> then the second one is actually we we haven't produ we haven't finished producing this video yet about the heavy metals. So hmm. I don't know if you guys were able to answer this one or if that one yes. was too hard. Yes, yes the answer, yes. And they were right, All, almost right, yes. Just, they just made some of the metals, but the common metals found in sargassum is cadmium, copper, chromium, nickel, lead, arsenic, and zinc. And we find what is the relation between sargassum and CDR. So for those who didn't know what is CDR, 
that's carbon dioxide removal. So, well, sargassum is an algae, so it does photosynthesis, and for that it needs carbon dioxide. Based on that, sargassum can be used as a sink for carbon, and then can help to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, one of the main causes of climate change. That were the three questions. Yes. So you can use sargassum to make biofuels, for example, ethanol or butanol. We already talked about animal feed today, bioplastic cosmetics. Um, that's used yeah, in, in cosmetics, pharmaceuticals and soil erosion. So I think a lot of you guys have already um, um, talked about these things. We haven't talked that much about soil erosion, but especially on beaches, a little bit of sargassum can be incorporated to, to make it erode less. So for bioethanol, um, there's an increased interest in using um, bioethanol because of climate change and um, we don't want to get the greenhouse gases from the fossil fuels. And for this, a lot of people are talk, use, trying to use bio, biofuels instead from renewable sources. And it's very popular in several countries, um, not only because of the ben en environmental benefits, but also because it becomes cost competitive domestic energy resources and to generate additional economic development. And that it is a domestic energy resource, I think it's really interesting that she's put that down because um, I think especially with the Ukraine war, we learned again that if you are not a fossil fuel producing country, that you are very dependent on other countries and the, the global price of this um, energy source. Um, and one of the alternatives to non-petroleum based sources is bioethanol. So how do you make bioethanol? Um, you normally need to have a pretreatment. Then you're doing enzymatic hydrolysis and then fermentation and distillation. Uh, the saccharification, so taking out sugars um, of macroalgae is important prior to ethanol fermentation. And various physical, chemical and biological pretreatments have been studied to increase the efficiency of the sac saccharification. Um, so the advantage of making sargassum bioethanol, um, you can use between 85 and 90% of the seaweed um, is water, sorry, which means it's, it's very suitable for biofuel making, especially anaerobic digestion, um, which can make biogas and fermentation to make ethanol. Um, Many seaweed species like sugar kelp have high carbohydrate and low lignin content. That is also perfect for making bioethanol. So seaweed is one of most efficient species, especially in absorbing nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. Because it grows so fast, it can absorb a lot of CO2. In fact, up to 66 tons of CO2 per hectare, which can help tackle ocean acidification as well on a local level. Um, fast growth also means that the CO2 emissions from the seafood biofuel are quickly reabsorbed by new growth. Yes. Um, in addition, seaweed doesn't need fresh water or fertilizing. Yeah, so if you want to grow seaweed, it's a lot easier. You need a lot less to grow it than if you were going to grow plants for biofuel. And um, Seaweed is also highly productive. Um, you can grow about 26 tons of dry ride by hectare compared to 2.3 tons of soy and 5.1 ton of corn. So um, the disadvantages is, um, I think the first one is actually advantage she wrote to me. Um, it reduces the local environmental impact. So 
um, you could reduce the amount of nutrients in an area, um, which can affect the sea life higher up in the food chain and can be actually positive, um, especially for um, ecosystems such as coral reefs that drive in nutrient poor areas rather than nutrient rich areas, which um, algae like to, to take over. Um, there are very few real-world seaweed biofuel projects um, because the life cycle emissions measurement is very difficult. Uh, most of the emissions don't come from the seaweed itself, but from making the nets and doing maintenance and harvesting, um, which of course could be improved by using electrical ships. So yeah, like everything, we, we already talked a bit about the disadvantages, the harvesting of the sargassum, and if you want to grow it, of course, there's emissions and there's cost involved. Um, so there's no business case developed yet for seaweed biofuels, and that makes it difficult to get investors. Also something we've talked about quite a lot today. And there is um, a reduced competition with agricultural food and feed crops and high yields per area, non-dependency on agricultural fertilizers, pesticides, farmable land, and fresh waters. Um, I'm not really honest. Yeah. A little addition because about the investors, it's the same as with microalgae. So it's not about that. It, it can be done uh, in an effective way, but the problem is that the uh, the fossil fuels are still way too competitive because it's still cheaper and the fossil fuel production is still subsidized in many ways and yeah. that's the reason why you cannot make it uh, in, a, in a feasible business case but and it has a, the fossil fuels also have a very strong lobby both for plastics and for fuels so it makes it very difficult to to get other products um off the market correct Yes. Yeah, because it's just an addition because a lot of people think it's too expensive to make it from ethanol, but it is expensive compared to what? And then it's expensive indeed to, to, to yeah, oil that you just pump out on an existing field, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and oil is, is becoming more expensive as well, like the yield per per amount of oil that you can pump, pump out. Like back in the days, you would be able to pump out a lot more oil with the same energy use but of course the the oil lobby has has become very ingrained in our in in the global political system and is getting subsidies and is making high profits that they can put back into their business which makes it hard for startups and and new things to to compete with them that's very true I think that was it. So we're almost done with the two hours. Um, so this was our class for now, but that doesn't mean we are finished um, as a group. So um, Evelyn and I, when we designed this, we designed it so that we have every month a get together um, online. And um, we can invite, if you're interested, we can just get together to get um, just us and talk about what has happened on our islands. If we've given any presentations, if we have worked on any solutions, but we also have the possibility to invite experts. So Evelyn and I know a lot of people in the sargassum um, world from <laughs> scientists to entrepreneurs to 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 different people so if you guys are interested in talking to a specific person or about a specific topic let us know and we'll try to invite those people to these um, get together so we'll have one in october one in november one in december january february march and potentially april so at least seven of these and if if you guys find them help, helpful, um, after April, our resin bit grant is finished, but you know, making these get togethers is not a lot of work. 
and if a lot of people are profiting from it, I think we would be happy to continue them. So my question is for you all, and may I'll, I'll ask it again tomorrow or today in the WhatsApp so everybody can vote. Would you rather have these get-togethers in an evening, like we had the class now, but it may be a bit harder to find the experts to come? Or could we also do them during the workday, or is that really hard for you guys to, to do it during the workday? Because I know some of you may, it may be easy to get on a Zoom call during work and, and your work supports it, and for others it may be quite difficult. I think if you plan it and if you just send us the dates uh, sometime in advance, then that should be feasible uh, to, to, to during the day. Okay. I, I would... And then all that is left is for you guys to, to go out in the world and educate others in your community about sargassum. So use the slides I made. And I'll, I'll send them to you again. Um, make your own slides. If you want, share this. If you make new slides, share them with the group. I mean, we have the WhatsApp group. We have the email chain. So, so feel free to share with each other. Um, you know, use it in any way you want. Like, you know, you don't have to per se do formal presentations. Um, you can do presentations to all kinds of different groups. Um, you can also... Um, do TikTok videos or social media outreach. You can, you know, if you have columns in the local newspaper, do that. If you, you know, you can give presentations at your work to your schools. I know some of you are teachers. All of these things count. But if you do something, so if you do any outreach, send me an email or send me a WhatsApp and let me know about it. Let me know how many people were there, where you did it, and that way we can keep track of it because as part of the grant, we told them that you will do these presentations, so I have to keep track of how many have been done. And yeah, and when we get together next month, I think we're gonna do the net, uh, what the meetup uh, always the first week of the month. We can also share with each other how it went um, talking to people about sargassum. Yes, and for anybody who has time to stay, uh, I would love for you guys to share where you think you're going to um, share this knowledge so that you can also um, inspire each other of places where you can have these talks. And Fran, we also wanted to do a podcast with the ones that wanted yes. to be in the podcast. Yes, so, I forgot about that. Yes, so we are planning to do a special podcast with you. Uh, the ones that would like to be in the podcast, of course, uh, saying your experience in the during the course, telling us how you felt, what are the applications you see you can use in your community, in your Iceland? So we are planning to do it like personal, uh, one short video per person, and then we are going to do a complete video. So if you would like to participate in this special edition of the podcast, please give us a thought in the WhatsApp and say yes, and we will put you in a list. Yes, and it will be a really short interview um, that we do on our platform. So it's literally similar to doing a Zoom call. And then we put all these different um, segments together and hopefully get really good, interesting um, podcasts about what all you guys are doing on your islands and how the course helped you or, yeah, and what, what, what you took away from the course. Yes. 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 We will give you the list of questions for the podcast. We always do for everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot. I think it was very uh, informative and uh, useful the way also the way you presented it. So you're definitely uh, Manfred and I already talked about it. We will definitely try to get it out in the news. 
papers to uh, get one or two articles also in the local language because that would be uh, very interesting yes local language will be key if you have the ability to do that yes that would be excellent yes 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 you are sharing the press release with them so maybe martin can translate it yes uh, i will share all those things tomorrow in an email so you get everything together okay i think that's it um anybody who has questions as usual um stay on ask us questions we're here to to answer anything you may have yes Anyway, thanks. Have a good night. I don't have any questions. I'll just follow up everything on the WhatsApp and keep you posted with all the information. Yes. Thank you, Jeffrey. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey. Thank, thank you as well, and good night. Good night. Thank you, Van. Thanks, Rachel, everyone. Bye-bye, Bye. -bye, Bye. Bye. Oh, thank you, Francisca. Thank it was you, a very inform It was very informative, and yes, I will see the last recording of the last um, course and also go through all the videos that I haven't had the time to to watch. But as I follow the course today, it was very informative, all the information that were presented to have an insight as well in the other islands. Yes, I found it really interesting as well and I learned a lot about the different islands. Yes. Here I will try to give presentations as well with the uh, different information that you got and videos. It is um, a lot of tools that you can use for different presentations. So. Thank you. And I see in Seba they're going to do a junior ranger session, which is really cool. Junior ranger program okay. in the Dutch Caribbean is oh. for kids who want to do more. Oh like an after-school program for kids who want to learn about nature. This course is made possible through funding by the Resilience, Sustainable Energy and Marine Biodiversity Program, Resenbit, financed under the 11th European Development Fund, EDF, Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Regional Program, ResinBit is being implemented by Expertise France, with the primary stakeholders being the 12 Caribbean overseas countries and territories. The course was designed by Francisca Elmer and Evelyn Salas, and the videos were produced by Marcel van der Kamp.